Dr. David Padgett, and the uh, issue is environmental uh, injustice uh, in uh, dealing with the uh, environmental justice uh, movement. And Dr. Patrick, since we are uh, dealing with this as our final segment, let's have you to sort of, uh, over the last eight or ten minutes, to sort of wrap up uh, some of the things that you believe that our audience ought to be familiar with, or ought to know, uh, concerning this uh, movement, as well as some of the issues involved in the movement. Okay, yeah. As I mentioned before, the uh, Bordeaux landfill had to deal with waste, and also the um, Dixon County case and the Sheila Holt family. Uh, that deals with waste again. And so waste is a problem that exists here nationally. We have a very wasteful society. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we're so wasteful that we export waste all over the world. Mm -hmm. And lead added acid batteries from our automobiles mm -hmm. end up in a Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. in India. Uh, then they're taken apart and mined for lead mm -hmm. by sometimes children. Mm -hmm. uh, who are exposed to those toxins or, or just poor people all over the mm -hmm. world exposed to our leftovers from mm -hmm. the automotive industry. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of our what's called tech waste, that's mm -hmm. a big thing now. A lot of computers and a lot of components in mm -hmm. computers uh, actually have uh, lead, gold, silver, mm -hmm. and other precious metals uh, that we that are mined after we ship these products mm -hmm. as waste overseas uh, after our computers become obsolete very quickly, we just send boatloads full of this material to Africa, India, poor countries where, again, poor people are engaged in a very dangerous and hazardous recycling process. And that is seen as an environmental injustice because any time that we have waste as a product of our activities, that's an environmental problem. Uh, and so low-income and poor people all over the world are being exposed to our toxic waste. There have been some uh, United Nations uh, agreements and, and um, mm -hmm. conventions to try to prevent that from happening, but it's very yeah, difficult mm -hmm. to regulate and almost impossible to enforce. Mm -hmm. um, looking at the global issues further, uh, the issue of, of global warming <clears throat> is something that we might think of as being uh, not a racial mm -hmm. issue, but uh, scientists are seeing now that those who are going to be disproportionately impacted by global warming are people of color. Mm -hmm. uh, we can look at perhaps a domestic example uh, with Hurricane Katrina. Uh, we now know, climatologists now know, that there is a d definite relationship between global warming and hurricanes. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, Hurricane Katrina, Rita, and Wilma that struck during that mm -hmm. 2005 season were some of the most massive, powerful hurricanes we've ever recorded. And that is a direct result of the waters being warmed up by this global warming phenomenon. Uh, and so right here, New Orleans, mm -hmm. global warming due to hurricanes. If we look abroad, uh, anytime we have global warming, there's going to be increased drought, uh, which means increased crop failure, which means famine uh, and disease in pop parts of the world that can ill afford to have their crops fail. They already have food and water shortages. And so global warming results, in many cases, in severe drought or more extreme droughts in Africa especially and in places where you have marginal uh, rainfall. And so global warming uh, and its disproportionate impacts upon people of color uh, is an environmental justice issue that uh, is being recognized. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are actually researchers, some at Howard University climatologists, that are working on ways to predict the advent of drought cycles so that perhaps we can ha act proactively to famine instead of reactively in some of these places of the world. Um, and also the energy crisis is a global crisis uh, that is impacting people of color disproportionately in that uh, we're now turning more to nuclear energy and oil, of course, and we've turned Africa more as in a uh, place where we get our oil. And in fact, a lot of us were alarmed with, at the Gulf oil spill. But those types of spills occur in Nigeria all the time. Not, maybe not that magnitude, but close to it. And people in Nigeria and in, in the Niger River Delta live right next to a lot of the pipelines and the oil 
uh, refinery facilities. It's even worse than what's happening in Cancer Alley in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. But we don't even hear about it. And yet, because of our thirst for oil, mm -hmm. collectively, uh, we are more dependent upon Nigeria, mm -hmm. uh, Gabon, and other places in Africa to exploit those mm -hmm. resources. Uh, as uranium becomes uh, more and more valuable as we're starting to turn, trying to turn away from petroleum resources, specifically because of what happened in the Gulf mm -hmm. uh, and the environmental security and all the problems associated with oil, uh, we're turning more towards uranium. Africa is becoming a greater and greater source of uranium, uranium. which is a very nasty, dangerous, and hazardous uh, mining uh, process. Mm -hmm. And so we have a lot of African countries uh, that are dealing with the waste. Uranium mining creates massive amounts of waste, toxic uh, piles of, 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 of waste right next to villages, uh, water, contaminated water leaking into people's homes and in and around, and people have to live around this stuff. And in many cases, another variable in the environmental, environmental injustice is when, is when people have to choose between making money mm -hmm. and having a clean environment. So a lot of African nations are saying, well, this uranium is going to bring us some money, but then at what cost? Mm -hmm. We're going to give up our health, we're going to give up our clean environments for this uranium, and that's a very difficult place for mm -hmm. people to be in. And in fact, one of the worst uh, but less well-known cases of environmental injustice in Africa is the mining of something called coal, coal tan. Mm -hmm. uh, coal tan is a mineral without which you would not have the cell phone industry or these PlayStation. Almost all of those tech, techno technical mm -hmm. tools uh, run off of this coal tan mineral. 80% mm -hmm. of the coal tan supply in the world is found in Central Africa, mined by people who uh, make less than $40 a month. Who couldn't even afford a cell phone. Of, yeah, multi-billion dollar industry that creates a lot of pollution, a lot of hazards. It's just another means of environmental exploitation of Africa with African people not gaining any of that wealth. It, it, I mean, you've heard of blood diamonds. Mm -hmm. well, well, you have blood diamonds, we have blood uranium. Uh, you may as well say we have blood cell phones and blood PlayStations. Uh, even some of the timber resources from Africa are being, are being pillaged, uh, so we even have blood timber. And so the result of this is that as Africa becomes a much more of a source of natural resources and raw, raw goods, especially oil and uranium, now we see a greater intervention of the U.S. military in Africa through what's called the African Command. Uh, and so now we have uh, a much greater intervention, mm -hmm. military, U.S. military in sub-Saharan Africa, mm -hmm. especially under the guise of fighting against terrorism. terrorism. You know, we've uh -huh. heard that before, mm -hmm. but actually, it's another move to put in place uh, a secure force mm -hmm. uh, in order to extract Expl these uh -huh. products. Mm -hmm. And it's basically the same thing mm -hmm. that happened in Iraq, mm -hmm. whereas now we know that after this long conflict, mm -hmm. the military is moving out of, the, out of Iraq and oil companies are moving into Iraq. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the same thing now is happening in, in Africa. Mm -hmm. And again, the byproducts of oil and energy resource exploitation and strategic mineral exploitation mm -hmm. is people are being exposed to all kinds suffering of suffering of the people. Of, and, uh, of, in other words, all over Africa. And they, well, what about Pakistan? You know, the recent uh, floods in uh, Pakistan. What, what impact uh, do you think that that will have? Well, that again is, you know, uh, lack of access to resources to mitigate mm -hmm. uh, these types of things. And some of the solutions that have been put forth uh, in Haiti, uh, in, in fact, in Africa, there's a Dr. Wangari Mathai, mm -hmm. who was the first uh, African woman mm -hmm. to win a Nobel Peace Prize. She actually used environmental remediation mm -hmm. uh, as a means to bring peace Mm -hmm. to Kenya. Mm -hmm. uh, and we see um, the, the Greenleaf movement mm -hmm. in Haiti uh, is another movement, an environmental-based movement, which says if we improve the earth and our surroundings, mm -hmm. then we can bring peace. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a global movement mm -hmm. that's largely built upon small grassroots organizations mm -hmm. all over the world uh, 
that is bringing a solution to some of these environmental injustices globally. Very good. And of course, Dr. Patrick, let me uh, thank you uh, for all of that uh, information and uh, tell you how much we appreciate that because uh, uh, no matter what we say, people are still suffering uh, and, and, and we certainly don't want to uh, uh, encourage that. And I think that you're doing everything that you can to keep that from happening. And let me encourage our audience to uh, tune in again next week for another informative edition of Comments. Thank you and good night.